and talk today about artificial intelligence and vascular medicine. Certainly don't consider myself an expert in this, more an interested uh, user. And we'll talk a little bit about experience at Houston Metro, so how we deployed several available systems. Uh, I'm also going to pull on some of the presentations that have been given uh, in the Bakey education. Uh, first release from Ranjin Patel, uh, who really helps define artificial intelligence and tell us what it really does. It finds patterns in data and then uses statistical techniques and tools to find those patterns in large data set and augments expertise. It certainly doesn't replace it. And so this idea of a convolutional neural network and how that data has inputted uh, the statistical methods, analyze it, and it creates certain hypotheses. And the hypotheses have been uh, deployed in a variety of different areas, such as finding strokes, finding aneurysms, finding pulmonary emboli, and many of these commercially available products. And so what the AI, the AI technique does is uh, reinforce learning. It allows you to create a number of different scenarios and identify which ones best fit the data. And so in terms of data analysis, it increases the speed. It's scalable and it's highly um, complex. It allows us to uh, deal with more complexity than the average human can actually deal with. So let me uh, pull uh, from Dr. Friedman, uh, who gave grand rounds uh, with us uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, and really a, an example which is truly astounding in terms of AC of scalability. And so I'll let him explain a little bit about how this can be applied. Actual potential, this change in voltage over time, which is controlled by ion channels, sodium channels, potassium channels, chloride channels that are so critical to life, they've minimally evolved from bacteria to humans. If you stop and think about it, every thought in your head right now, every move you make and every breath you take is controlled by these currents. And it turns out that these currents are impacted by disease often before we can see changes in an MRI scan or a CT scan or an echocardiogram so that diseases can be detected when otherwise seemingly occult or early. And if we aggregate millions of these, we get the surface recording, the electrocardiogram, which is ubiquitous, inexpensive, integrated into medical workflows, available from South Africa to South Korea and from South America to Europe. And so what we did was we uh, took advantage of this robust digital warehouse of medical data, and we utilized a convolutional neural network, a form of artificial intelligence, where it's designed to mimic human cortex. Only instead of individual neurons, there are simple math equations, which like neurons, once there are sufficient inputs, they generate a threshold output. And the key point is you would first put in an electrocardiogram, the voltage time waveform, and ask the network, what's the ejection fraction? And it would have no idea. And it would guess, it would say 35%. And during training, we would say, no, it's actually 55%. And through a process of back propagation, it starts adjusting the weights and biases in each of these neurons to slowly get the network closer and closer to creating a function that if you give it an ECG, it can give you the answer. And the key point, as I started to say, is that to initially train the network, it takes a lot of data and a lot of computing power. But once it's trained, you have a math equation you can run on a smartphone. And in fact, we then tested it. And we measure the performance of a test with the receiver operating characteristic. And uh, as you're aware, a like treadmill test has a 0.85 as does a mammogram, a pap smear is a 0.7. This test, the computer's ability to read an ECG and say, is left ventricular dysfunction present was 0.93. So a very powerful medical test. Now, what we're going to show you here is our virtual monitoring center at Methodist Hospital. Uh, now, imagine you can take these EKGs, apply them in our virtual ICU, which is what this is monitoring, and pour not only the electrocardiographic data, but other forms of data, the uh, PO2. Um, we can put in blood gases. We can put in electrolytes. You know, all of these things that can be monitored and transmitted are now being pulled into uh, the central computer. And this uh, company is called uh, Medical Informatics, which is a company for in Houston, actually, that we um, Hoth has worked with, worked with, uses this formula called SickBay to do these analyses. And so this is an example, really, of this. So the computer sending this EKG to clinician for review, is that's done as automation, but using these millions of beat morphologies to determine which beats represent arrhythmia, uh, more so than that, can we predict patients going on a heart failure? Can we predict patients who are going to have MI? 
That's the power that this potentially can generate, and this is deployed in, in an active use in our ICU really at the moment. And so these virtual ICU and analytics, not only can it do profound analyses as we've described, but it also allows us to look at it and, and try to influence hospital matrix that are important, such as length of stay and mortality, uh, all because we were starting to collect this data semi-automatically. Of course, you know, what's out there at the moment is automated image review. This has been deployed really for uh, um, for stroke. It's deployed already for uh, pulmonary embolism detection, uh, dilated aorta detection. Here's an example basically from Siemens where it can do automatic segmentation of the aorta. Uh, this is the publication in which it can pull out, identify aortic aneurysm, but it can also help do automatic EVAR planning. We train it to the things that we need to know are the diameter of the aorta, center lines of the renal artery, center lines of the LX, diameter of the LX. And so a lot of this data can now be done, you know, based basically upon segmentation, uh, automatic image analysis, and AI basically to continue to interrogate it. Here's another example of where, where we use. We're very interested in transcranial Doppler looking at embolization during TAVR or aortic arch interventions. The problem is there's not enough people who can, who can actually do this. And so this is a robot from NeuroSignal that automatically it can find a signal. But not only, of course, does it find a signal. The important thing about all of these uh, protocols is they're collecting data continuously and continuing to update that. And so these search patterns can be identified. It can be it can find the middle cerebral artery signal faster and probably better and lock onto it and stay locked on it during the course of the, of the procedure, making uh, TCD, in which there's not a lot of expertise, more available really to the masses. Another example here is uh, using uh, data really to, uh, to basically take a cathode robot and teach it really how to interrogate the, the image data and autonomously navigate and catheterize the left renal artery. That's the power potentially of cathode robotics and being able to uh, fuse it with image segmentation, draw in a flight plan for it, have it basically move autonomously. Another more simple example that we've been involved in and published recently is putting RFID tags onto instruments, having a smart table that can actually detect this. It can count the instruments on the table, off the table, the ones that they use, and, and continuously feed back to uh, refine the number of uh, instruments that we require and to be able to tell us whether those instruments missing really at the end of the case. Again, just another example of automating uh, and then basically tracking and then using AI to continually improve, for example, the, the utilization of the trays. And this is an example of how this was piloted in Cadaver. This is now also uh, commercially available and, and being deployed. And for us, anything that improves in nursing efficiency, because that's a real problem in getting nurses, you know, is, is worthwhile in, uh, you know, investing in. Finally, a lot of the, um, the, the video analysis going on has really come out of the uh, vehicle or the autonomous vehicle, so which are all equipped with a variety of different sensors. Now imagine these sensors being deployed in an operating room. Now, first of all, let me show you an example of what a Tesla is actually doing uh, when it's driving down the road. When the Tesla basically is driving, uh, then there's a series of analyses which are going on. Now, this is all numbers, and you can see that it's looking at street signs, it's looking at the car in front, it's telling you about the stop, and if you look basically what it says, wet road, it can even detect puddles. And this is all based upon and synth synthesizing the data from these sensors. And again, imagine deploying this in the operating room. And this is one of the, the, the Appella, something that we've already deployed. Uh, what happens in this situation is that you essentially have um, image analysis which has taken place in the operating room and it looks very much like Tesla. It's tracking our nurses, it's tracking, it's identifying blue drapes, it's, it's identifying where the patient is intubated. And this data is all being utilized to try and improve the efficiency uh, which is occurring basically in our operating rooms. So this is a pretty high level example of the things that we are doing at Methodist. And obviously uh, there are massive potential opportunities uh, for using uh, AI to improve our efficiency uh, and improve the decision-making disease. Thank you very much for your attention.